Good morning, everybody. Uh, I am so happy to see so many of you out on a Sunday morning. Uh, you know, as a festival planner, Sunday morning at noon is really just about the worst time to plan anything because you're just never sure when people will either make it from church or wake up in the morning. And you know, those who've been out very late the night before. So we're thrilled to have you all here. Um, my name is Katherine Colbert. I am the co-founder of the Athena Film Festival. I run the Athena Center for Leadership Studies here at Barnard. And I just have to thank all of you for participating in the festival. I hope we have a whole lot of great films uh, later in the day. Our closing film is Defret, so uh, please partake in all, as many of them as you want. Uh, we would love to have you. And more than anything, I just thank you for coming because Particularly this group, many of you are film professionals, you're uh, students who are interested in film or music or a variety of other art forms, and you are the heart of the festival. Uh, without having filmmakers who are interested in learning from each other and submitting their films and participating in panels, none of this works. So thank you, tremendous amount. The other thank yous I have to give you, you've been seeing a, a slideshow as you've been waiting that listed all our sponsors. Uh, they make this all possible. Uh, in particular, I wanna thank uh, Regina K. Scully and the Artemis Rising Foundation uh, for their support as the founding sponsor of the festival. Regina always says to me, make sure you tell them that it is a woman, on, uh, a woman philanthropist supporting a women's project. That's what we'd love to encourage more of. Uh, and all those good men who uh, like us as well. So we're thrilled to have uh, Regina as our founding sponsor and to the Ford Foundation Just Films who have sponsored our master classes and uh, the workshops for filmmakers. So thank you uh, as well. And then lastly, thank you to Seed and Spark who has co-hosted this particular panel. Uh, the best part of this panel is yet to come because it's uh, an introduction to Emily uh, who runs Seed and Spark. Uh, Emily Best is an independent filmmaker, somebody who has helped other filmmakers uh, use crowdsourcing and other storytelling te uh, techniques to enhance their efforts to help them distribute their films to really participate as uh, equals in a world that's very, very uh, difficult to break through. So I have uh, the honor of presenting to you Emily Best. Hello, oh wow, hi guys. Um, so I sort of don't know what to do when there's nothing on the screen. Uh, but I will say that uh, thank you first of all, of course to Melissa and Kitty, to the Athena Film Festival and to all the sponsors. Um, I came to this festival for the first time I think in its second year and learned something about my inner feminism that I didn't know, which was when Gloria Steinem just took the stage, I spontaneously burst into tears. Um, and that feeling of the way that women carry uh, so much energy into this festival to help one another, um, to learn from one another, to support one another, uh, is one of my favorite things that happens all year. So it's an utter honor to be here. Um, the second thing I want to tell you is that this crowdfunding to build independence workshop, how are we doing on those slides back there? One moment. Um, this crowdfunding to build independence workshop assumes uh, one major thing to start. And it is that uh, you would like to make a living making motion pictures, or some of you making music, um, but that your idea is to make an independent, sustainable living at your uh, craft. Um, wonderful. Um, so I'm not gonna teach you how to break into Hollywood because I don't know. And, uh, and really this is about gaining the skills to build a lasting, sustainable, and direct relationship with your audience. 
Um, the third thing I will tell you is this is not going to be a two-hour timeshare sale of Seed and Spark. I'm going to tell you about what we do because it will help to provide some context. And then other than that, this will work on any platform for any business anywhere. And we have actually statistical evidence to prove that. Um, but this is what this is. This is about using crowdfunding to learn to build independence in your career as an artist. So what are we? Crowdfunding, um, Seed and Spark is a crowdfunding platform that has integrated uh, distribution. Um, there are a couple of unbelievably exciting things. This is being live streamed. It is? OK, so then I won't be able to tell you exactly what is about to happen, but you guys, it's really cool. So the crowdfunding platform works like a wedding registry. You list the individual items you need, and your supporters can uh, contribute money towards those items, or they can loan them to you directly. So if you need a 5D camera for the um, uh, short film that you want to make, and I have that 5D camera, I, and it's not working during this time, I can just loan it to you. That comes out of your crowdfunding total. Um, because it's not about fundraising, it's about filmmaking. Um, a couple of things that sort of set us apart, uh, you can gather supporters, those are the people who contribute towards your campaign. You can also gather followers. These, and the literal symbol, you can't tell really, is a high five. These are people who may not have money, but definitely want to sign up for your updates. They're probably sharing your project, making themselves look cool by saying that I saw this project first, or I met this musician when they were still in school. Um, <clears throat> the wishlist crowdfunding model has the highest campaign success rate in the world. Um, we can say that, and because I don't run the crowdfunding department at the company, I really feel like I can brag about that. Um, so that part's really cool. We are um, an incentive-based crowdfunding platform, which is to say, like the other major platforms, um, you offer incentives. And then Seed and Spark also offers incentives to your supporters in the form of Sparks. These are rewards points that they can spend to watch movies on the streaming platform. And the reason that's cool is that every time you choose to crowdfund with us, you are giving your audience the opportunity to, for free, experience other independent films in this space. So just the act of crowdfunding with us is supporting the crowdfunding community at large, which is pretty exciting. And the other thing is those filmmakers still get paid for those views. Someday we'll discover that that may not be a great business model, but we'll see. Um, I'll have some other things to tell you about the platform along the way. We're built for staged financing, which means if you want to raise money for development and you want to come back six months later and raise money for production, for example, you can do that all within the same page. Um, we have very low fees. Those are some things about us, and we'll get into more details later. Um, the streaming distribution platform is a transactional VOD platform. That means you pay to rent a movie for a couple of days. Um, and we have just struck deals that we will announce soon uh, that will, with a successful crowdfunding campaign that reaches a certain audience threshold, that means number of followers, which you can gather even after your campaign has closed, you will be able to get out to iTunes cable VOD and qualify for theatrical release, which is a pipeline that has never been true in the film business before. So we're really proud of that, and we'll be announcing that in the next couple of weeks. Um, oh yeah, I have to advance the slides. Um, we also publish Bright Ideas. This is a film culture magazine. Uh, it's not a trade. This is really for cultured film audiences to figure out who is up and coming and to really push on the edges. Um, the magazine, the company, sort of our whole um, ethos is dedicated to greater diversity in independent film. Why? Well, let's be honest, guys. <laughs> Indie film has taken on a bit of a uh, upper middle class white people finding themselves brand. And that's a really saturated marketplace. So <laughs> the more different kinds of films we make, the more different kinds of audiences we serve. And that is a growth model. Um, it's a business argument and it's also a social argument. Um, and Bright Ideas is really meant to sort of lead the way into the culture. It's distributed at all the top North American film festivals. You can also subscribe, and a few of you, if you'd like to participate today, will also take home issue three with subscription discount cards and all that stuff in there if you're into it. Um, we, uh, for this educational purpose, work with a company called Tug. How many of you have heard of a company called Tug? Zero. One person, and he works with me, so that doesn't count. Um, uh, 
Tug is a crowdsourced theatrical release platform. So um, let's say I want to see, let's say, let's just pretend that Diffret is on the Tug platform and I want to host a screening of Diffret in my city. I pick a theater nearby. Most theaters in the nation work with Tug. I pick a date and I start getting my friends to buy tickets. And if you hit a minimum threshold of tickets, you get a theatrical screening of the movie that you have promoted in your town. Now filmmakers are building promoter networks for themselves and releasing their films theatrically this way. Um, the cool thing about it is that it is the only way that we know of to not lose money on a theatrical release, which is pretty impressive. Um, okay, so that was an introduction to all the companies you might hear about, um, and the purpose of telling you about those is the tools are available to you now to exploit this, a direct connection to your audience. And why should you care about a direct connection to your audience? Because it is the only proven path to independence so far. So 10 years ago, maybe we could say 15 now, before the landscape utterly changed of film, and why did it change? Well, technology, I mean, uh, the price dropped of technology, which made production surge, and then digital distribution messed everything up, right? We, nobody knows where to watch stuff, or we're watching it everywhere, or we're pirating it, or whatever. It got really confusing for a while, and the, bless you, and the filmmakers who have really won in this environment are the ones who have built a long-standing direct connection to their audience. There's not intermediaries getting in the way of the people who are paying you for the work that you're, get, for the work that you're doing. So this is really about your career. So we're gonna talk about how to build a crowdfunding campaign for a single film, but these are skills that will work for you to build independence throughout your entire career, which is more the point. It's not about the single project, it's about how do you get to a place where you can build a family and feed them, if that's what you're into, on the work that you do as an artist. Okay, so if you're thinking about crowdfunding, it's already starting, it's already time, this is really funny for people, when you're in the development phase and you're like, I haven't made this project yet, it is already time to start thinking about the downstream goal. So ultimately, it isn't about making a film, it's about getting people to watch it. And as hard as it feels upstream to get a film funded, it is way harder <laughs> to get people to watch it when it's finished. So it's really important to start building your funding campaign with the idea in mind that you wanna get as many people to watch it as possible in the future. So how are you going to deliver your film? Like what platforms is it gonna go out on? And how do you know those are good choices? Um, what happens if you get picked up by a distributor? Does anybody know how much it, uh, it costs uh, to deliver to Netflix if you get picked up in an all rights deal out of a festival? About $110,000. Right? And they don't like cover that cost for you. So just so you know. So you do really want to think about your goals and what it will cost for you to get there because that becomes part of your budget. What happens if you don't get picked up by a distributor and it is up to you to deliver your film to audiences and make it successful? What resources will you have to bring to bear to do that? Um, where do you want to screen festivals and theatrically? And how do you know? Right? So there's one thing, it's what you want, right? And the other thing is what your audiences want. And how do you figure out what your audiences want and, and where they will be? And then of course, it's really important to know how much all of this will cost so you understand what kind of resources you have to bring to bear to this whole strategy. And we start with three very simple questions. Who the hell is your audience? Where the hell are they? And how the hell do you get their email addresses? Um, this sounds funny, I know, I heard you chuckling. Here's the thing, email addresses are the most high value direct connection you can get short of me being able to touch Shelby on the shoulder, why? How many of you are not in possession of a smartphone? Exactly. So social media is a tool for, uh, for working on you know, your outreach campaigns, but it is not a means unto itself. Getting likes on Twitter or getting likes on Facebook or getting followers on Twitter only proves that you're good at getting likes on Facebook and followers on Twitter. It doesn't prove that you're gonna get people to show up 
on a day like this, um, I'm pretty sure these lovely ladies from Berkeley had nothing to do with my Twitter feed that they showed up here, right? Something totally else got them here, and I'll learn about that at some point. Um, social media is a tool. So think about it as these concentric circles. Um, in the outermost ring is all the people that you don't know. That's most of the people on the planet, right? Then there's a, a, an inner ring that is everyone you can reach on social media. And that's not, it doesn't lack value. It's valuable, but it's not reliable, right? It's feed-based, it's algorithm-based. Who sees your post is not necessarily something that you can control even when you promote posts. Like, Lord knows who sees what on Facebook or how you can tell. Um, <clears throat> The inner circle to that is everybody whose email addresses you have. This is the next level of sort of commitment from your audience saying, yes, I will let you get right into my pocket on my smartphone um, in something that I will probably check, right? And then the center of the circle is people who will show up to do things. So why does this matter? Well, it's important to understand that it isn't about using social media to sort of get as many people paying attention to you as possible. It's about developing a relationship with people over time that draws them from the ether into the center. And the email address part is really important because it means you're establishing different kinds of calls to action over time that get people really interested in continuing to hear from you. And what we know about emails is that is the highest rate of conversion from uh, to things like funding and showing up, right? So I posted on Twitter and I might have a 0.02% conversion of people who saw my Twitter post and people who show up today. Through email, we see conversions of up to as much as 20%. That's way better, right? So that's why we talk about how the hell do you get your audience's email addresses. And it's important to think about this because your metrics for success should be related to what you want to accomplish. If what you want to accomplish is 100,000 Twitter followers, then your metrics are, how many Twitter followers do I have? But if your metrics are, how much money can I make from my film, then your metrics should be related to, how many people can I get to show up and buy a ticket, right? So here's what happens when we say, who the hell is your audience? Um, this, is a, this is sort of a, a, a cruel Sunday uh, example, but I'm going to give it anyway because it's effective. Um, we say to filmmakers, who is your audience? And they'll say, well, you know, my film is really for everyone. Uh, and we're like, everyone. Hmm. Okay, so uh, there's this book. It's called The Bible. And it has arguably had the longest marketing campaign in human history. And not even everyone has read that. And in fact, there's like entire factions of people who are like, I'm never going to read that. Right? So everyone is probably not the answer. And because that's a really snotty thing to say, they'll be like, fine, fine, fine. My audience is women between the ages of 24 and 35. And we say, mm hmm. Uh, so we show them these pictures, and they really hate this part. Uh, these three women are between the ages of 24 and 35. And I'm going to go ahead and guess they may not hang out on the same social media platforms. They probably don't speak to each other in the same slang. They don't listen to the same music, and they sure as shit don't watch the same movies, right? So let's go a little bit further. And let me just say, if you're a studio, and you have a $200 million marketing budget, you go ahead and market to an entire demographic. It's called the spray and pray method. But you guys, bullets are expensive. So if you are a studio and you can market to the entire demographic, fantastic, do it and see how many of the women between the ages of 24 and 35 actually come to watch your movie. I argue they're the ones who would have come had you done a little bit more research and marketed to them a little bit better. But if you're an independent filmmaker and you have limited marketing resources or maybe no marketing resources other than your own elbow grease, you have to get much more specific. So, uh, who in here has a film that they are thinking about crowdfunding? Would you be willing to give me the logline and synopsis of your film? I'm calling you out. Go for it. Give me chills. 
Love is Fluid. The film title is? Water. Water. Oh, so good. Water. Love is Fluid. Uh, a young artist falls in love with a man and then falls in love with a woman and has to decide who she is as an artist and who she is as a person. How many of you would like to see that movie? I would like to see that movie. Okay, awesome. So look around. A lot of different demographics represented in those hands. I just want to point that out. Um, uh, Larry, you raised your hand. May I, just for a moment, uh, where do you hang out online? Are you on any social media? Not on any social media. So where do you get your news and find out about your movies? Word of mouth, great. Um, where do you get your news? New York Times Online. New York Times Online, write this down. Um, what kind of music do you listen to? Anything from New Orleans jazz to um, Paul Simon. Yeah. Jazz and the greats, right. got it. 70s, I mean, uh, rock and roll stuff. Other than the New York Times Online, what else do you read? Not much online? No. Not much online, okay. And uh, I know what you do with your free time. You go on amazing trips all over the place. He's a traveler. That's an important piece of information. And then where do you watch your movies? Um, in television and then. And through, the so theater and on the TV. And do you have like Apple TV or Roku? Yeah. Apple TV, okay, great. Uh, one of these young ladies also said you would see this movie. Which of you? Great. Uh, what's your name? Marissa. Marissa, where do you, what social media platforms are you on? Um, Twitter and Facebook. Twitter and Facebook. What times of day? All day? All day. All day. <laughs> <laughs> Me too, boo-boo. Um, where do you get your news? Um, from my apps and online and TV. What apps? Uh, NPR, BBC, ABC, CNN. Okay, so here's something that's really interesting. Totally different demographics, very similar news habits, right? Erudite, maybe uh, sort of on the, on the serious side, like NPR and, like they didn't say BuzzFeed, right, or HuffPo. They said NPR and, and New York Times, putting me to shame. Um, great, <laughs> and what kind of music do you listen to? Every, everything. Everything, yeah. all over the place, yes. okay. Um, what kind of music do you play? Um, I play jazz, I play classical, I play funk. Two I play... people said jazz. <laughs> I just want to point that out. Okay. Everything. Uh, where do you spend your free time if you have any? You're a student, right? Yes. Do you have any free time? Um, no. Are we taking it up right now? <laughs> <Okay>. Yes. <laughs> Got it. Fine. Um, so student, which means reachable on a campus, right? And where are the campus resources that reach you? Um, where? Yeah, like, is it through your email? Is it through oh. a bulletin board? Like, how do people... Email, Facebook, uh, even text. Text. Yeah. Ooh. I, yes. Uh, and when you watch stuff, are you watching Curled Up on Your Laptop through Netflix? Uh, yes. Uh, Where laptop, else? Laptop, uh, theaters, um, TV. Great. Yeah. And one more hand, please. You raised your hand. What's your name? Leon. Leon. Um... Leon, where do you hang out online? What are your social media platforms? Um, social media? Facebook's like the only one I use. Facebook, okay. And where do you get your news? Um, usually contemporary, um, like the big ones, CNN, um, New York Times, things like that, but also sometimes Huffington Post. HuffPo, Slate? Yeah. Yep. Uh, what kind of music do you listen to? Um, Hip hop and jazz and Three classical. Three people said jazz. Okay, <laughs> yep, go on. Um, 90s rock. Uh, I have a playlist for you. Um, <laughs> what blogs do you read? Any? Uh, Shadow and Act. Shadow um, and Act. Um, I can't think of any others that I read consistently. Okay. So just keep in mind, by the way, that when you ask these questions in rooms full of mostly filmmakers, you're going to get kind of a... a certain responses that you need to make sure you're breaking out of when you do this. Because of course, we're gonna say shadow and act and women in Hollywood and things like that. And those are good places to be, but they won't get to Larry, right? So we still have to really think about where, where we're getting to Larry. And um, where do you watch what you watch? Uh, Netflix, Hulu. Um, on your laptop, on a TV? Laptops, usually. Laptops, usually, yeah. okay. 
So do you start to see how this sort of line of questioning might teach you some things about where you want to reach out? We are already crowdfunding, you guys. And I'll tell you why. If I could go back to the moment that we decided to call the thing that NPR has been doing for years, crowdfunding, right? Um, <clears throat> I would ask them to go back and call it crowd dash 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 funding. Because without the crowd, there is no funding. It's, it's a two word compound word that has an order that is specific to the order in which you need to think of things. It's not called funding crowd for a reason. We're all looking for the funding crowd and if you find them, give me a call. Um, <clears throat> it's really important to understand your crowd, to build your crowd and to prove to yourself that you can get strangers to sign up for your email list before you ever ask anyone for money because that means you're doing something valuable that they're excited about. So we have just gone through a little interview that helps you start to understand what we mean when we say uh, you're gonna learn to do some message testing. These questions that we just applied to this upcoming film, Water, will help you learn what you're saying. So what is it about your film that reached out to everyone and sort of grabbed them at first? Where you're saying it, sounds like Facebook is gonna be an important uh, platform for you, um, and who will help you amplify your message. So it sounds like for this crowd, you really want to find the kind of traditional media outlets who are going to cover you. Can you get a little mention on NewYorkTimes.com? Can you get HuffPo to cover something that you're doing? Work all the angles there. And it could be that if you do this interview six more times, and I highly encourage you to do that, you might find a couple other places that you will meet um, that you will be able to sort of amplify your message. The thing about this information is that it could actually change the course of your project. If, I don't know, four more people all mentioned that they listen to jazz, you might want to think about how that affects the score of your film, right? And certainly how that affects your pitch materials. Um, <clears throat> if everyone says, you know, it's NPR and New York Times and all of those things, then the way that you talk about your film and the materials you put together are gonna have that more sort of serious erudite tone as opposed to the BuzzFeed crew that would be like, and you'll never guess what she chooses, right? That's probably not gonna work for you in this case. Um, but this is where you actually start to collaborate with your audience. This is a really interesting thing because when crowdfunding started and uh, a lot of people talked about how you have to sort of like sell out or pander to your audience. This made me feel very upset because pandering suggests you think your audience is stupid, which is weird because if they're your audience, it means your movies are stupid. But you should, as a baseline, assume that your audience is at least as smart as you think you are. That's a good place to start. Um, so this is where you start your audience collaboration. Um, and I'm just going to pause here and say um, partnerships and the people who will help you amplify your message, that has to be something you're thinking about way, way in advance. Um, people will be like, yeah, I'm doing a social justice film. We're going to get the NAACP to tweet about us. And I'm like, R really? How are, how are you going to do that? Why would they do that? Um, so when thinking about reaching out to partners and people who will help you amplify your message, it's really important to understand what you are offering to them such that they should want to help you, particularly if you're reaching out to nonprofits. So nonprofits have to raise money on their own, right? They have their own uh, initiatives that they have to fulfill. So if you are going to give them uh, a reason to write about you or send you out in their mailing list because you're also asking for money, they have to understand what they're getting out of it. And you should start by either calling them and asking them, kind of like the interview we just did with the audience, or doing some research and figuring out what it is you have to offer. Are you, is there content that you're making that they could then use for their own fundraising initiatives? Have you built up a reach that is appealing to them? Do you have some connections that might help them with their initiatives? And this goes uh, for brands just as much as it does for nonprofits. You have to come up with a sort of beautiful, concise way to say, here's what we have to offer. And I'll give you an example. Um, last year, I taught uh, an earlier version of this class 
uh, along with uh, our director of crowdfunding, Erica Anderson, in uh, 21 cities in 35 days. We hit the road, we smacked a magnet on the side of my car, and we drove all the way across the country and all the way back. And including where we flew to before that, we taught this class in 40 cities last year. Um, we reached thousands of filmmakers. And as a result, <laughs> We have 140 requests for workshops in 2015. And what happened? Well, some brands that we had been talking to got very interested by the fact that we were going to be teaching up to 5,000 filmmakers in the US in 2015. And so G Technology, the maker of those beautiful premium hard drives, uh, said, you know what? We will sponsor the entire 2015 Stay Indie Tour, which is what the tour of this workshop is called, because you have a reach. We will offer discounts and cool things to the filmmakers who attend these workshops. We'll give you guys the gas and airfare money in order to make sure you can come and offer these workshops for free um, all over the country, which is both a blessing and a curse because now we really are doing a lot of traveling. Um, <laughs> But they, uh, they saw this as a really mutually beneficial relationship. You guys are going 